Happy 25th anniversary, Legend of Zelda! Hello everyone, Green Scorpion here, and ready to pay homage to one of the greatest video game franchises of all time. 2011 is almost behind us, so before that happens, I will be honoring The Legend of Zelda's successful 25 years by listing the top 15 greatest boss battles from The Legend of Zelda series. The Legend of Zelda stormed the gaming industry with innovative gaming elements, and their boss battles are no exception. Now a few things before we begin. I will be judging these bosses based on design, creativity, attack style, level of difficulty, and they'll even win some points for personality and music. As for rules, I'm including one per game, which means there will be one from each canon Zelda game, no final bosses or mini bosses, and none from Skyward Sword since I haven't beaten it yet. And finally, just to warn you guys, there are a lot of spoilers on this list. Now that that's out of the way, let's get started. Okay, sure, the boss that starts the countdown is one from the very first game, but let's not forget, this game was huge for its time, and it is responsible for the masterpieces we play today. The bosses may seem simple compared to today, but they were definitely innovative, and that goes double for Manhandla from the level 3 dungeon. Manhandla is a carnivorous plant monster that dashes through the field, shoots fireballs, and has four heads that want to eat you alive! So, it's a piranha plant on steroids. This boss is simple. You can either use your sword to take out its heads, or you can make it easy on yourself and just use bombs. This boss may seem ancient, but it definitely set a good example for future boss fights. Link's Awakening is easily the strangest Zelda game of the franchise. The entire game puts you in a state of uncertainty because you have no idea what's going on, and the director's cut even pits you against enemies from the Mario series. The boss battles in this game are equally strange, but the best one in my opinion is a slime eel from Catfish's Maw. The visual design of this boss is nothing special, it's just a huge eel. The combat on the other hand makes up for it. Link must use the hookshot to drag the eel out of the wall to reveal its weak spot, all while dodging the eel's tail that's spinning around the room. This boss requires skill and timing, especially since the eel speeds up as it takes damage, and it can trick you by showing you a fake eel. This boss also gains additional points since it is the first boss in the game that warns Link about the consequences should he awake the windfish. This boss was creative, and the level of difficulty gives a fair challenge as well, setting him apart from the other bosses in the game. I love the Four Swords. It was fun, and it was a seminal predecessor to four-player single-player gaming, which gave us games like New Super Mario Bros. Wii and Kirby's Return to Dreamland. There are only three bosses in this game, besides the final boss, but the best one is the Guchitato from the Sea of Trees. It may be another plant monster, but this boss requires teamwork in order to defeat it, making it especially memorable. Deguchi Tato attacks by sprouting its heads and swinging them around its base, which, consequently, also reveals its weak point. The trick is that its weak spot shows a certain color that corresponds to the Link that should attack it. Once they're all defeated, the Links must pull the handles that appear at the base to reveal the final head which has two colors instead of one, so two Links must attack it simultaneously to finish it. I will say that, while the battle is fun, it's lower on the list because the overall design of the boss isn't really that great, and it's pathetically easy. I had a harder time against Manhandler from the first game. Still, this battle is certainly unique, mainly because of the aspect of teamwork, and it's battles like this that make playing with friends that much more fun. Speaking of which... The Four Swords Adventures game took the aspect of teamwork that the Four Swords had and refined it to perfection. With more dungeons, a clear story, being able to beat the game by yourself or with up to four friends, and teamwork-centric boss battles. The best one in my opinion being Jalhalla from the Swamp. This is one boss battle in which you need help from all four links. There are four torches that are switch activated and once each link has one lit, Jalhalla will reveal himself and the battle begins. 
This battle can get tricky since Jalhala can only be damaged within the light. However, once he is damaged, he will HOLY- Anyway, once he's damaged, he will... do that. And he'll send out a bunch of mini Jalhalas to attack. This causes the battle to get hectic, and this is where playing with four players really helps. You battle Jalhala again in Hyrule Castle, but I think the battle in the swamp is much better, putting it at number 12. Ultimately, Oracle of Seasons pretty much recycled the bosses from the first Legend of Zelda game and gave them some new tricks. This recycling gimmick was a little disappointing, but it was pretty cool to see what those bosses were truly capable of. Now I know what you're thinking. Manhandler, right? Well, no. I like Manhandler, but what it does in Legend of Zelda, Dig Dogger from the Unicorn's Cave does it better in Oracle of Seasons. When it comes to video games, I like it when something unexpected is thrown your way. And while the design and attack style is nothing special, the method in which you defeat Dick Dogger certainly makes up for it. The sword is useless at first, so you have to use the magnetic gloves to ram a giant iron ball into Dick Dogger as it slides across the room. Once Dick Dogger has taken a few hits, it'll split into many mini Dick Doggers, which is where the sword comes in. Eventually, Dick Dogger will regroup again. Rinse and repeat. It's low on the list mainly because the rest of the criteria for this boss comes up short, but the battle itself certainly lives up to why we love The Legend of Zelda so much. As I said just now, I like the unexpected, whether it involves puzzles, story, or combat. Phantom Hourglass definitely showed this, especially in the battle against Kriak from the Temple of Courage. This battle is anything but simple. Kriak is a giant hermit crab, which is unique, and it has the ability to turn invisible. To defeat him, you must use the top screen of the DS to see what Kriak sees, which allows you to see where he is in relation to where Link is. Once you have him in your sights, his sights, whatever, you have to fire an arrow at his face, which will reveal him. Then you proceed to hit the weak points of his shell, eventually breaking it. This causes Kriak to go from stealthy to defensive as he adopts a fencing stance to attack Link head-on. To defeat him, you have to force him into a defensive state, then swoop behind him and slash its tail, all while avoiding the mini Kriaks that are trying to distract you. Not only is this battle clever, it was unique and very well put together, forcing you to multitask and improvise and earning it the number 10 spot. I was skeptical at first about spirit tracks. All I could think was... Trains? Seriously? However, once I started playing it, I loved it. However, I will say that some of the boss battles in the game were a little underwhelming to me. But that wasn't the case with Kragma from the Fire Temple. This boss's sheer size tells you that you're going to have your hands full with this fight. At first, Kragma will try to flatten you by pounding you with his fist, which causes debris to fall from the ceiling. You have to start off by shooting a pressure point on Kragma's body, which is revealed as he readies his attack. Once you do, Kragma will get mad and hit the ground with such force that it knocks a boulder onto the field. You have to either bait Kragma into smashing it or use a bomb to turn the boulder into a stepping stone, which you use to board a minecart. This is where the battle gets fun. As you're riding the minecart, you must use your arrows to shoot the rest of the pressure points on Kragma's body to damage him all while preventing him from knocking you off. Eventually, you'll reach its high. You shoot it, and it reveals his weak point. Strike it enough, and the battle is won. While the music is okay at best, and his weak spots are obvious, the overall design and the creativity of the battle make it stand out from the other bosses in the game. Many consider Zelda 2 to be the oddball of a franchise, and with good reason. After all, it is the only Zelda game that focused solely on side-scrolling and a level-up system. This game was particularly hard, and the Thunderbird from the Great Palace was no exception. First of all, you have to prepare for this boss by casting a shield spell to reduce damage, a jump spell to reach its weak point, and a reflect spell to be able to block its fireball attack. And when you reach the Thunderbird, all you can think is, I have to fight that? 
This boss emanates power. That is fitting because the Thunderbird is invincible. You can't hurt it. The only way to defeat it is by casting a Thunder Spell, which reveals its weak point and you can attack it with your sword. By this time, you've used up so much magic that you won't be able to even cast a heal spell, so you only have one shot. The Thunderbird's attack style is simple. It just hovers around and shoots fireballs. However, the more damage it takes, the faster it attacks, making the battle much harder. This battle also scores points for music. Even though it plays throughout the temple, it certainly reinforces the tension of the player during this battle. Once the Thunderbird is defeated, you're on top of the world. But then you have to fight Dark Link. Have fun with that. Majora's Mask was a dark game. This game got so emotionally charged that I actually cried a few times. Pussy. Shut up! Anyway, the game focused more on side quests, so bosses were few, but they were far from disappointing. Originally, I was gonna go with Twin Mold from the Stone Tower Temple, but ultimately, I went with God from the Snowhead Temple. Or Goat. Or whatever. In truth, the battle against this boss is probably one of the simplest in Zelda history, but simple certainly doesn't mean easy. Gaunt is a masked bull, which actually makes for a pretty cool design, and all he does is charge in a circular room while flinging boulders at you, fires electrical beams from his horns, and causes stalactites to fall. I made that sound so simple, didn't I? To defeat him, you have to turn into a Goron and roll after him. This battle gets tricky because both Link and Gott are traveling really fast, and if you didn't take the time to get the increased magic meter from the Snowhead Fairy, you have to rely on pots that are conveniently spread around the room which contain magic jars to keep your magic meter full, adding to the challenge. While the concept is simple, it's definitely one of the most fun battles in Zelda history. It's fast, it's chaotic, and an all-around great boss from one of the darkest games of the franchise. That's it for now, part 2 coming next week.